We're talking about the kind of God that we worship, Jesus being the final word, the ultimate revelation of God, and how that we become like what we worship. And we're looking at different idols, basically, that we have created with our own hands as Christians many times and, and make those idols, those images of God that we have created the final revelation, the, the God that we are worshiping. And as I said, we become just like what we worship. And we've looked at the American God that we've created. We talked a little bit last time about the denominational gods that we make and that we worship. And then we have, <coughs> excuse me, other gods. We have the daddy God, you know, uh, our image of God. And like it or not, this isn't pop psychology, but the truth of the matter is, like it or not, our image of God many times is heavily, heavily affected by our image of our earthly father. Our earthly dad has a great impact upon our concepts and thoughts about God as a father. You know, and if we've had a dad who's heavy authoritarian, He's abusive, maybe he's passive, he's uninvolved, he's distant, uh, maybe manipulative, driving, and maybe a workaholic, a controlling, uninterested, he's not there, not present, he's distant. All of these negative connotations that we get from our fathers, many times we don't realize it, but then we project those things upon God, and we think that's the way God is. He's just like my daddy. And the reality is, and I know this because I've sat now for 30-something years with people in counseling sessions and listened to them describe their image of God, and it matches and lines up many times exactly with their image of their earthly dad and how him rejecting them, they believe God rejects them, how he didn't show love to them, they don't believe God loves them. I mean, all of these things. And so we create an image of God again. It's false, but we believe it's true, and we worship that image, and therefore we become just like that. And then, of course, you've got the doctrinal or the theological God. And in the West, especially, you've got two brands of the theological God. You have the Calvinist brand of the theological God, and then you have the Arminian brand of the theological God. You know, the Calvinist God, the five-pointer, he's a five-pointer just like we are. You know, he thinks Tulip is exactly right. You know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, you know, kind of, you know, everybody's bad, as, you know, not as bad as they could be, but they're just completely warped and marred, corrupted by sin. That out of this group, unconditionally, God chose a certain amount of people, way smaller than the amount that he didn't choose, that he's going to save. And they hadn't gotten any say-so in about it at all. He's going to save them no matter what and forgive them of their sins. That limited atonement that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't really die for the sins of the world. No, 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 no. He only died for the people he chose that he's going to elect and save. And then, of course, irresistible grace. Well, if you're going to die for these people you, and you promise you're going to save them, then you got to give them something to get them to come to you, and that's something that's irresistible. They can't say no to it, so you give them that irresistible grace, and then you make sure they hang in there till the end. You're going to see safely home what you have shed your blood for. This Calvinist God, because he's so big and he's so powerful, this God is big on control, sovereign. He's ruler. He's king. He's loving, but only to a select group. Not everybody, just to his that he's chosen. He's heavy on pointing out how wretched we are, how bad we are, our total depravity. His work on the cross was limited only to a specific group. He forces his will on people. Whether they want it or not, he's going to save them. He's going to grab them and bring them in. But he guarantees you're going to get to heaven. He delights in punishing the wicked he delights on taking vengeance of the, against those who resist him. He's violent against sin so much that he literally beat the hell out of his son on the cross. That he punished him because of our sins. And he made him pay for our sins and tortured him and killed him for our sins instead of us. If somebody was to do that in our own culture, we'd call that abuse. We'd be calling the law on him real quick. But this God does this. And he ends up really being a cosmic monster. Justified or and justifying killing. Then you've got the Arminian God. Well, the Arminian God, well, you're bad. But you're not too bad. You're not as bad as you could be. This God's weak, you know. 
Whereas the Calvinist God's going to save you and he's going to get you there. This God's weak because you know what? You're more powerful than he is because he's completely dependent on whether you say yes or no. Your will, your will is more powerful than God. You have the power to say, no, I'm not going to come to you. And he can't do anything about it. He's got to sit back. His poor little hands are tied. He can't do anything to save you. He loves you, but he can't guarantee you will accept his love. Oh, please love me, please love me, please love me. But he can't guarantee that you're going to accept that love. And, and then, of course, if you don't accept that love, he's going to roast you in hell forever. And, of course, he wants to save you, but he can't do it except by your consent. Only some, you know, can or will be saved. Only some are going to accept this wonderful invitation. And he already knows who's going to do that because he's, you know, he's big on foreknowledge. So he knows who's going to say yes to him. But the rest of them, he's determined to roast them in eternal flames, determined to fry them for all eternity. And even though Jesus supposedly died for everybody and took care of sin for everybody, sorry, if you can't muster up enough faith, if you can't pull it out from somewhere down deep inside, you're out. You're all still guilty for something that's already been done away with according to scripture where sin's been paid for, sin's been forgiven, everybody's been reconciled to God according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. But that doesn't matter because you're going to still have to pay for something Jesus already dealt with. Even though he's big and this God is sovereign, he's not bigger than your will, you end up having more power than he does. This God is a God of conditional love. Accept me, and I accept you. Reject me, and I fry you. And recently we posted on uh, our Facebook page, and then, of course, on the church Facebook page, an article by Benjamin Corey about ISIS burning all these people alive, and the whole thought process of how we condemn, we condemn, we condemn all that, and yet, because of the God theologically that we worship, we can say that even though that's a horrendous thing in the eyes of humanity, ISIS is doing this, but God in the Bible, he will do this to much of humanity. He will fry them forever and it will be right. It will be just. In fact, some even say that, that we'll be able to look from the banisters of heaven and smile upon the suffering of the wicked. That is such heresy, such a false God. That is the God that is like the pagan deities that people created and worshiped. It's not the God is revealed of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've seen the American God, we've seen the denominational God, we've seen the daddy God, we've seen the big theological God. And when we get back together, there's one more we're going to talk about, the cultural God. Think about that. I pray that the one place you'll look to find the true revelation of God is in one person's face, and that's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ.